it's a, a great pleasure to be here. I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I want to shock you and tell you that this is the only slide you get. So uh, write down my email in case you're interested in what I'm going to talk about because it will disappear. Can I do? Yes, there we go. So I want you just to relax and, and let's sit and chat a little bit. Uh, I um, have really enjoyed these presentations today. They've given me an excellent introduction, especially the presentations by Vincent and the presentation by Magdalena just now. I also am here representing a career branch that you might call communication. And so Magdalena was presenting what uh, is a, a very clear and for many people very good career path, a natural career change after a PhD and postdoc, which is going to work for an established publisher or a particular journal. And I also, at one point in my career, as I'll explain later, thought of that path. But I decided I, I didn't really want to defend the interests of a particular publisher or journal. Rather, I wanted to, as it were, defend the interests of authors, of scientists like yourselves, when you had an, a fascinating story, but you weren't quite sure how to pitch it, how to present it. So people are constantly, even today, they're asking me, what do you do? And I tell them, I don't know. <laughs> I'm having fun. I'm a, I tell them I'm a PR person for scientists. I'm a public relations man for scientists. So my job is to help scientists present their work to other experts, to other scientists. I, I help them when they need to publish manuscripts, when they need to uh, submit grant applications, make a presentation. I work with uh, institutes, universities, individual scientists, mostly in Asia and actually a bit in Europe. So, uh, and I must say, it's taken me quite a road, so I'll talk about that road in the second part of my talk. But I think I've managed, uh, I can say, like Vincent, that I really do enjoy what I do because I've, I've never fit in to convenient holes and probably a lot of you can identify with this. You know, you guys are hyper-educated, hyper-curious, hyper-underpaid, <laughs> and you're kind of looking for a, an outlet for your passions, right, without getting put into prison. So you have to, I'm sure you've realized this as, as scientists, society is not made for thinkers like us, right? So, you know, scientists are the people who, at lunch, they're pitching some crazy idea that no one would have thought of, and the other people at the table looking, you could do that, but why? Or something like that. And we're the oddballs. You know, the stereotypes exist for a reason. We're, we're freaky, kind of, because we're, we want to study, you know, a fruit fly for two years just to see what one little gene will do to a leg or something. The reality, which I hope you're seeing as we go through today and, and tomorrow, is that there are actually, amazingly, a lot of employers and career paths who want freaks like you, but a lot of it comes down to how you present yourself. And uh, one of the key messages I want to give you, and there's no bullet point up here, so just write it down, is to know thyself, okay? I don't know, the Greeks and the Romans, whoever first came up with this idea, but this is really critical, to know yourself, and Vincent gave you that pie chart with the at the very least, know yourself well enough to know what you don't like, because you will then start to converge on a few things that might give you a salary. And, and this, is, this was kind of my road. So let me start by saying what I do now a little bit and, uh, and what it might mean for you when you're looking. Then I'll talk a little bit about how I got where I am. So this third space that a few speakers have mentioned, this is fascinating to me, I'm learning. I didn't know that it had a name. So in my day, when I was younger, there was no third space. There was academia or evil industry. And you always had to have the word evil in there, right? So it was the, the good and then the dark side. And it was that incredible uh, dialectic. So, you know, we, we were all starving graduate students and we wanted a decent living, but we didn't want to go to the dark side. The reality, you all are very lucky, probably because 97 odd percent of you cannot take the traditional academic path. There's so many of you now that the labor market is changing a lot, and there are tremendous opportunities for people who want to work with communication, not necessarily with a publisher or journal. So some that immediately come to mind are um, scientific management. So this was a job that didn't really exist when I was a graduate student, but it's now becoming fairly standard, fairly common in, in, in academic institutions, for, uh, and, and, and a minimum condition is PhD. 
So you as PhD people, this can become for you, and I predict it will, a, a very clear feeder path if you decide to leave the bench. If you don't want to do industry or don't want to work in publishing, you can, you can go and become a scientific manager. Scientific writer is another career that's becoming standard in some ways, it isn't quite yet, but is becoming, where you're working at an institute or in an academic department, uh, writing. So writing for the press, writing for other scientists, helping edit sci uh, scientists' work so that when they submit it to journals. There's a lot of writing that you can do for money that doesn't involve working for a publisher, if that's your thing. Another path that you might even think about now when you're a student, but don't tell your boss, is you can work as a language editor. So you have more and more services where a scientist, for example, from China, who wants to publish their work in a Western journal but doesn't speak very good English, they send you their paper, they pay, and you make it into something that someone can understand. You have a lot of companies now, even Nature, Nature Springer has a company, Wiley has its own company. I'm not entirely sure exactly their business models, but in my day when these companies just started, they looked for graduate students, they looked for postdocs. So this was a, a job on the side. So consider uh, sending your CV to one of these editing companies to see if you like doing that. So it's, uh, and that actually, I got into that as a side job in one of the jobs that was making me miserable. And it ended up turning me into a career path. So as, a, as someone interested in writing, you have a lot of options where a PhD is an essential piece of your credibility and gives you um, a lot of um, uh, chances, actually. So if you're interested, write that email, which is no longer there, or uh, meet me afterwards. Let me tell you a little bit how I got where I am. And I want to narrate a story where it's a bit of listening to Vincent reminded me of my own story. If you look at it, you might think it's a random walk. But actually, when I made various career shifts, at the time, I had very clear reasons. So I prefer to think the metaphor is not random walk. My, my career path was more rat in a maze. So, you know, I, I, there's a cheese, and I'm going to get it, but it's going to take me a strange path to get there. And I have to say, I have found my cheese, as it were. And uh, that's why I guess I'm here today, to share you my wisdom. So first, I, uh, at the beginning, when I was younger, like many of you, I knew my way. I had a 20-year career plan. So as an American, I had to do better than the communists. As you know, communist governments usually like to have five-year plans, or seven. Something. I had 20. I was going to do an excellent first degree, then go do an excellent PhD, then go to an excellent postdoc, then go to an excellent institution, and become a group leader, and publish a lot of excellent papers, and get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> it hasn't quite turned out that way. Although, I do hear through the grapevine that my chances for the Nobel are getting marginally better with each year just because my competitors are getting older and dying. <laughs> so if I have to wait that long, I will, because I, I will do what it takes. And I went along, so I did, uh, I did my undergraduate in chemistry and biochemistry. I was always more interested in biology, actually, but at the molecular level. So I said, let me get a good foundation in chemistry. And then when I did PhD, it was a mixture, mostly more biology now, but still molecular. So crystallography, structural biology. And it was a very Nietzschean experience. It um, taught me a lot and didn't quite kill me. So then I, I decided for my postdoc, I, wa I still had my 20-year plan. For my postdoc, I would switch fields to something even a bit more biological. So what I decided to do was to combine protein biochemistry with molecular neuroscience. And it was... It was I was so proud of my decision, it was so logical. So, you know, I, because this was, so I had my added value. You know, these are these catch words. That you, you know, what is your added value? What do you bring to us? I brought to this neuro lab, which do, didn't do much with, pro, proteins were bands on a Western blot, but I knew structures of proteins. And I said, I will come and we will do proteomics on this problem. So it was very, it was also kind of Nietzschean. So I, I was the only protein person in the lab, so I had to set up my HPLC in the cold room. I had triple gloves on, you know, trying to set up the columns and everything. And I worked for just over a year. I took a system that they developed in their lab, and I was going to bring it down to the molecules. And I, I, I got to them samples, and I sent away for analysis. And things just weren't working. So after a year and some, and I should say, I had, during my PhD, I had spent almost, 
what, just over five years struggling. And I, uh, <laughs> my boss was a great, brilliant scientist, but fairly useless. I think I was his first and last student. So he gave me, when I started my PhD, he gave me a project that, you know, was already difficult. And after about a year and a half, he said, okay, I begged him, please, can I have something else? He, he gave me another project, which was even more ambitious. And I remember going with him to a big pharma conference, because it was in the field of hepatitis B. So we were going to find these structures that would blow open the field for new drug discovery. And we, my boss and I were having discussions with postdocs and, and managers at, at uh, Novartis and uh, Smith Klein and all that before they changed their names. And those postdocs, when they found out what I was working on, they said, oh, you're doing that. Would you like our plasmids? We have freezers full of them. So it turns out they had teams of 10 postdocs working on what I was doing as one graduate student, and they'd given up. And I turned to my boss and I said, if Novartis has given up on this with 10 postdocs, what are you trying to do to me? Right? <laughs> so that was my PhD. So then I go into my postdoc with the triple gloves in the cold room, and after just a year and a half, fortunately, I had wised up and I said, whoa, what's going wrong with this project? It's not working. And after a lot of thinking, I love libraries, by the way. I'm, I'm not Internet 2.0, I'm kind of 1.5. So I, I like to hang out in the library and read old papers. And I was reading a paper from 1968 related to my project in my postdoc. And it was exactly described as exactly my problem. And I, I had, it was a click moment and I realized I had been studying an artifact for the last year and a half. And in fact, the, the neuron paper on which I, the reason I went to that lab was probably an artifact. And I said, okay, Chapin, uh, you have a choice. You, can, I, you know that if you stay in research, you will only work on very ambitious things because that's who I am. But then you know, in science, if it's worth doing, it's going to take you, you know, 10 years, you will want to kill yourself at various points in that. And then when you come home to your paycheck, you will want to kill yourself again. <laughs> and I decided this, this is a turning point. So there was that, plus there were some family things that happened. And all things together, I questioned, for the first time at the age of 30-some, I questioned my 20-year plan. And I said, is this really, where am I going? What do I want to do? How am I going to get there? And that was a, a watershed moment, as the politicians would say, and I'm, I'm kind of grateful for that moment. And so I did a lot of thinking. And that set, it, set me on a course. At that time, I didn't know what else I wanted to do. I just knew I didn't want to do bench work. So I thought about working for a publisher that wasn't as attractive. I knew I loved to teach. So I went to go teach. I taught for a while biology and chemistry at high school and university levels. But that, for me, it, wasn't, it was missing some intellectual stimulation. So then I, I, I knew I wanted international as well, because I had done an exchange, a study abroad in, in university. It was wonderful, so I said, I want to go abroad again. So I worked as an international manager at a large science nonprofit. This was even less intellectually satisfying and very bureaucratic, so I didn't want to do that. So then I, I tried management consulting, and this is a path that is kind of standard for, for scientists still today. And this is, it, it can be a very good path because you have analytical skills that people want. So I went to McKinsey, someone presented McKinsey, uh, our lady earlier today. Uh, I applied, I got through the first round, I couldn't believe it because you have to do a lot of math and my math is terrible, but I made it. And then they're inviting us, there are about five of us, to a fancy hotel in New York City. And we're walking to the hotel, and one of the other finalists, she's saying, have you heard the salary, the starting salary of these consultants? I said, no, $100,000. I said, my God, that's, wow, that's pretty good. I didn't know what that, I get to the hotel. We have a series of five interviews. Each interview is essentially, they throw you scenarios. So they say, okay, you're working with a client. So in my case, the first one was, you're working with a client, it's a music production company. They sell CDs. They lost $15 million last year on CD sales. They want you to turn that into profit for the next year. They want to know what's going wrong and what to do better. So I listened and I said, all right, I can do this. All right, 15 million CDs, okay, music, market segmentation. I had read the books, I knew the lingo. 
I thought I made several interesting suggestions. When the interview finished and the interviewer is leading me back to the waiting room for my next attack, he said, all right, this was your first interview, so I'll give you some advice. If the client says they've lost $15 million, you have to at least act like it's important. And I said, okay, right, it's important. 15 million, you know, 15 million. Now, you're, you're laughing because you're saying 15 million, but this was back then, okay, when 15 million bought, you know, a cup of coffee. So that was a big click for me. I thought, all right, I don't think this management consulting is for me. I don't care about money, and I certainly don't care. I mean, I don't much care about making it for myself, and I certainly don't care about making more money for a company. So that led me to realize, and this is one of the take-home messages I want to give you, is as part of know thyself, is know what are the principles of your employer. Find, it, find employers whose principles you can support, whose principles even advance what you believe in. Because if the principles don't align with yours, you're going to find a very hard time, usually, getting motivated about the job. Every job has principles and activities that you do every day. You may love the activities that you do every day. I love to answer phones. I love to talk to people. I like to plan. I like to coordinate. But if the, if the fundamental principles of that organization are constantly bothering you, you will have a problem. So that was, that was a big call for me. The other, the other quick story I have before I, I finish, uh, I tried at one point to, uh, I looked at uh, becoming a trainer actually, a learning engineer, but for big pharma. And I managed to get an interview, so I went to Novartis. I felt like a king. They flew me to Boston, hotel, they gave me food, it was wonderful. I even got dressed up, put a tie on. And I, in, I met with various department uh, unit managers, and I thought I did very well. But at the complimentary lunch, at the end of it, the HR person who would have been my boss, he said, you know, the problem we have with your CV is that we don't see a trajectory. We don't see a clear path. We don't know where you're going. And I thought, I don't know where I'm going either. I don't <laughs> that was another wake-up call. So the, sort of, the message I'll end with, and, and hopefully we'll have a little discussion afterwards, is society, for better or for worse, including employers of you, for better or for worse, they prefer people who have a career path. And one of the challenges that you should find, that you will have, is how to create a career path out of what is usually, for most of us, a fairly chaotic, unpredictable, and unintended kind of circuitous route, that, that rat in the maze. You have to do this. You have to write a CV that talks about a trajectory, at least in that moment. You have to write a cover letter. You have to present yourself in an interview with a trajectory. And you can still do that and be authentic. It is possible. And I think I, the example of Vincent is a very excellent one. So uh, I'm happy to talk with you about uh, options as an author's advocate and uh, also about how to manage a crazy career path. So with that, I will stop my part. Thanks.